Welcome to Commons Conversations, a series of interviews with campaigners sharing their experience and insights into activism, learning and movements, radical history and more. The program is broadcast by Community Radio 3CR and produced by the Commons Social Change Library, a website containing over 1,000 resources for campaigners, which can be accessed for free at commonslibrary.org. In this week's show, Grace Vegasana interviews Millie Telford about her experiences with campaigning, starting with her first formal act of activism in Grade 3. Millie was active in the Australian Youth Climate Coalition prior to co-founding and leading SEED Indigenous Youth Climate Network. She worked with SEED for 10 years and has recently moved on, focusing on First Nations justice through a new role at Australian Progress. During the interview, Millie discusses a range of recent shifts that have come about in Australian society thanks to the activism of First Nations communities. She also outlines the challenges for those communities in finding and working with allies and the way in which centering the voices of those most affected by issues works to benefit all. Hi, I'm Grace. Um, I am a 23-year-old woman of Kana um, from Southeast India and Botswana uh, and I basically just really care about community but I particularly care about my communities um, who are from Western Sydney which is the most culturally and linguistically and religiously diverse region on the continent and I really care about building the power of young people from communities who are being impacted uh, by climate change to be able to actually respond and forge the solutions that we need to intersecting crises. For you Millie, who are you in your own words? Thanks, Grace. Um, I'm really looking forward to this interview and I feel like it's exciting that you and I get to do it together. I feel like we can explain what that connection is to each other at some point. Um, but yeah, I am Amelia Telford, but most people know me as Millie and I am a Bundjalung and South Sea Islander woman. And so home for me, where my country is, where I grew up is Northern New South Wales. Um, one of the most beautiful places in the world I believe it's like where the rainforest meets the ocean um and yeah and where like the salt water is just such a special place for us but I am living down on Wurundjeri country in Melbourne where I've been for um almost about 10 years now um and I yeah what else about me I have um, spent most of my adult life, like since finishing high school, working in the climate justice space, um, building up young people um, and have recently just in the last few months gone through a, a big transition um, to move into another, um, like, like a new role um, uh, where I'm broadly working um, on First Nations justice and, and advocacy and supporting First Nations leadership in a new role at Australian Progress. But I, um, in terms of like who else I am, um, I'm also a stepmom or a mum because I don't really like the framing of stepmom, but um, I, my partner who is from Melbourne had two beautiful daughters before we met. And so their names are Nari and Kaya. Yeah, I think I've just been reflecting recently on how much um, raising them has empowered me to 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 really think about um you know how much we are trying to fight for their future and and hopefully but I don't know if it's realistic or not but like hopefully we can create you know a world where they don't have to fight as much as we do but yeah that's me <laughs> that's really beautiful I love that you can reflect on yourself both in like a professional capacity but also who you are outside of that and what that makes you Let's wind it back a little bit. So what drew or threw you into this work, working around climate change, working around First Nations justice? Um, what were these catalysts that made you step into this work? Yeah, I've reflected on this. And, you know, I think that for a lot of us who work in community organising and campaigning, like often we have our personal narratives of, you know, the moment that we stepped in. And like, there's quite a few moments for me over the years, but really like when I break it down I think it actually all starts from my childhood and like who my parents are and you know my dad as a black man being with my mum who is a white woman um, you know really I think a lot of the injustices that my um, brothers and I experienced growing up um, and the stories we heard about the way that our parents were treated even by their own families it exposed us to the 
you know, the injustice, the racism, yeah, like discrimination that that people face in the world. And like mum and dad had to fight pretty hard just to be together um, and to bring us kids into the world. So I think, you know, there was so much resilience and strength and, and hardship that like we heard about. And then, you know, that then led to, I guess, our, our parents instilling really strong values in us around, you know, how everything that we do and every decision we make has an impact on on the world and like our community around us and and instilled values of like looking after one another and looking after country and you know even little things like when we'd go out like to the beach or into the bush and dad would always say like leave only footsteps or or actually like if you can like leave a place better than you found it i think that sort of stuff just like really rubbed off r- rubbed off on us um and to a point where even in you know primary school, I remember getting pretty fired up about about I guess standing up for what I felt was right. An example of that is um, it didn't make sense to me hearing the Australian anthem, Advance Australia Fair, and I in grade three, like I wrote a letter to the Prime Minister, who was John Howard at the time, asking him to change the national anthem. And at the time, I felt that a song that would like better suit this country was the song We Are One. I don't know if I would agree with that to this day, but, um, you know, at the time, um, to me, that song felt much more fitting to us as as a, as a nation that um, was made up of people who've been here for tens of thousands of years and people who've come here more recently. And anyway, so I wrote to John Howard. Um, he wrote back saying, you know, thanks for your letter, but unfortunately, nine out of 10 Australians um, still believe that Advance Australia Fair is, you know, the most fitting national anthem. And uh, I then was like, well, when I look around my, you know, my house and my community and my school, actually, I don't know where you get that statistic from because lots of people I talk to don't agree with that. And so then I started a petition. And anyways, I guess what draws out to me is just like that, that fight that um, or the fire in in my belly that existed from a really young age. And I think that's the case for a lot of a lot of First Nations young people and 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 communities, like because we yeah, we're born into a world that, you know, doesn't always love us and doesn't always treat us with the same respect and 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 value our lives in the same way that it values others. And so we're inherently, um, you know, we have this responsibility that not only exists from a, like a, a cultural responsibility to look after our land and look after each other, but we're surrounded by injustice and discrimination. And so, you know, we're, we're, whether it's influenced by our family and like those who are, are fighting for our rights or just being amongst that and having experienced it and then having to fight, you know, for change. It was just, I guess, in some ways, like inevitable, like to end up here. But then in terms of learning more about climate change, it was, yeah, experiencing, um, like learning about climate change at high school, witnessing like severe coastal erosion along the East Coast at home and and really starting to like connect the dots between what it means to be a First Nations person and have a responsibility to look after country and the fact that our our land um, and our future like is being taken away from us like um, and yet we aren't the ones like making those decisions and aren't the ones that you know have the we've done the least to cause the problem and yet we're facing the most severe consequences and that just did not sit right. Um, and so, yeah, along the years started getting more and more involved. And yeah, that's great. And I think it's really, really beautiful to hear like your story in your own words and where it actually comes from for you as well. I really wanted to reflect on two things that you said. Um, one was your dad's like value of leaving a place better than you found it. And also the feeling the impacts both within yourself and your community of climate change, but knowing there wasn't the decision-making and the structural ability to actually create change. And I think a really clear part of your legacy, and I assume the work that you're going to be doing going forward is actually shaping and forging better futures within organisations, within the progressive movement, um, and creating those better places and entering spaces and leaving them way better than you found them. So I wanted to reflect a little bit on your journey of starting out really young in the climate movement, finding a place and how do you feel like, did you feel like it was the right place and what made you realise it needed to change and needed it to be a place that you left better than you found it? Mm, that's really beautiful, Grace. I'd never um, yeah, made that connection because when I think about 
dad's words I always think about like physically like being out on country but I think you're right yeah that I am really proud of the impact that you know myself and a whole bunch of others have had on making particularly yeah uh the climate movement but more broadly progressive movements more aware of yeah the the communities who are most impacted and who need to be at the center of of everything we're doing and and playing leadership roles like in this work well I think the first thing I'd point out is that this is such a common story amongst so many first nations people like having to trailblaze a pathway um you know whether it it it's like the first Indigenous doctors or the first Indigenous lawyers or the, yeah, like so often we have mob who exist in places that they, they don't have many First Nations peers around them. Um, and so I think just acknowledging that is important. For me, getting involved in the climate movement, I think from the very first event I went to, which was Power Shift um, in two thousand. 11 hosted by AYCC. I was in grade 11 at the time and it was pretty evident even in the lead up to it where like for example I got a call from the AYCC team at the time asking me to speak to a a plenary speech and I got asked to do it on behalf of Indigenous youth and I said well I'd I'd love to accept the the place to speak but I can't do it on behalf of Indigenous youth I'll do it on behalf of myself and and my family um, because actually there's a breadth of, you know, our people, a huge diversity of our people right across the nation. And I can't speak for everyone, but I can speak for myself, you know, and, and I think just like that in itself, like really says a lot, like there there weren't many other mob who'd been involved before. And it you can't, I think just like having an Indigenous perspective, you know, on climate, like it just shows how there was such a lack of understanding of the inherent role that Indigenous people play in um, in looking after our land as we've done so for generations and how important our leadership is in terms of, you know, the knowledge that we have of our country and, and what it takes to look after country, but also our place in in building the solutions that are actually going to work um, and doing so with, you know, justice at the centre of that and centering our rights and, you know, and the fact that if we were empowered to be making decisions about what happens to our country, then like we wouldn't have ended up in this mess in the first place. And so, you know, I guess like the, the at the time, like I was a bright eyed, bushy tailed, whatever that phrase is, you know, like naive young person in a lot of ways. Like I just was so, I think it wasn't until I met other people like Larissa um, Baldwin, who actually went to go to Power Shift 2011, walked in the door, looked around, said to herself, this is too white. And she left. And so like, it wasn't actually until I contacted Riz to come to Power Shift 2013 that like she got involved in the climate movement. And, you know, the, there's there's a story that goes on from there. But yeah, I think I just like had so much optimism and energy and and I think that's important. But there were moments over the years that followed where I sort of had these like wake up calls where I was like, oh shit, like we're actually up against these like really entrenched systems of capitalism and patriarchy and white supremacy and colonialism that that this is going to, this is going to be a big journey. Um, and it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of people. And the way to, to do that is to then build up people and build up more young mob and like build up our leadership and build up a network of support for one another to be able to trailblaze that path together. Because I think it's, you know, there's like no one person that's like going to change all of this. And like, we need to do it together and have each other's back through it. There's so many lessons that we had along the way, like in terms of finding the balance between trying to make other spaces better for us versus just creating our own spaces that we need for ourselves. And like, and how do you build up allies to uh, like who we can can trust, um, who can do that, you know, that sort of allyship, solidarity building work, not necessarily like on our behalf, but doing so in a way that takes the burden off us because we could just spend our whole lives every single day trying to make everyone else better, but it takes away from the energy and time that we can be investing in ourselves and in our own communities. So it's a lot, but like there's actually so many mob in so many different sort of sectors and and organisations and spaces that have gone through a similar journey to what we have in in the climate space. I think that's definitely an interesting balance between finding 
the need to build own spaces and actually forge the the environments and the communities that are needed to thrive within their own right versus finding that balance of like building up people around you to also be doing that work outside of those spaces too with like broader communities. Hi, I'm Jeffrey. I'm Alphonse. I'm Erwin. And we, we are, are from, from the Voice of West Papua. Papua. Tuesday, 6.30 until 7.30 p.m. News and music from West Papua. You're listening to Commons Conversations, a program in which campaigners discuss their experiences in creating social change. In today's program, Grace Vegasana chats with Millie Telford, a co-founder of Seed Indigenous Youth Climate Network. I remember at the Water is Life gathering in Canberra in Parliament House, there was the concept of concentric circles where basically the sit-in kind of happened where mob and elders were in the centre um, and like were able to speak and there was like rows of allies like sort of in concentric circles around them so that if police were to start removing people, they would take the people who are least vulnerable or most comfortable with police contact and that would both buy time but also protect the people in the centre. Keen to like unpack this a little bit in a way, is this like an approach that you see to how you've worked within the climate movement of actually building those spaces but also creating the barriers that you need to be able to protect those spaces with other people and allies working on that way? Mm. Yeah, I th- um, it's funny to reflect on that moment because I actually wasn't able to be in Parliament House inside at like um, in that sit-in because I'd been banned from Parliament House from a previous sit-in a few months earlier. Um, So that was a hard moment for me to like, I was um, with the outside group, outside the doors, and everyone else was inside. So like we were together and communicating and it was super powerful, but I didn't get to quite experience that exact moment. But that's how we planned it. Like we planned it to have First Nations people in the centre and then have, yeah, non-Indigenous allies surrounding us, exactly as you say, so that we were able to hold the space as we needed to and like the, you know, all the speakers and everything um, and people's voices were being heard from the middle and we expected that, yeah, as people started to get removed that we'd get removed from the outside first. I think what actually ended up happening was that we like held space for as long as we could and then everyone at a certain point decided it was time to leave together and so everyone stood up together and walked out together which I think is also beautiful like and yeah we'd done the work to like liaise I guess with the security and police to try and yeah give us as much time to hold that space but I think in reality like the thing to note is that yeah as much as we try and create safe spaces like at the at this point in time like that's never a guarantee and like police are are not safe like for our communities and continue to to kill our people and so yeah how we how we do this work in a way that like protects ourselves but also holds them accountable and pushes them to actually create the change that we need like is one that yeah like I don't know that there's like a perfect answer for but what I think is most challenging and like as a reflection on you know just to sort of reflect on how in my time while I was like leading and working within seed and like you got involved in AYCC I think at the time where you got involved we were this is from my memory might might be different from your memory grace but like we the the AYCC and seed relationship was really strong and we had like really um strong allies within AYCC who we'd invested a lot in over the years where like, you know, we'd worked so closely together. Um, Those people had, you know, skills and expertise that they would, that they were investing in us, but then we were investing in them to like be able to work with our mob in a way that was like culturally um, appropriate and everything. But then what happened, and I think this is like not only the nature of just youth organizing where like people come and go, but what happened was, you know, when some of 
those people who had spent years of like working with us where we'd given them feedback in moments where they fucked up or like, you know, like we'd, we'd been through a lot together when some of those people moved on and we had newer people stepping up who hadn't had that deep, you know, work to, together. It meant that in order for us to keep working in that way, it required like, um, like First Nations people to like to give so much in order to build people to trust people to then go and um, like hold those spaces for us. And actually there was a moment where I was like, I don't know that that's actually realistic. And if that's okay for that to be something that we're willing to give, um, because actually it's asking a lot of like emotional labor and time and energy and like resources that we actually just like didn't really have. And so it was at that point that, and and a variety of other reasons, but it was at that point that I was like, maybe, you know, the nature of how SEED and AYCC works together actually needs to be different because I don't know that we can continue to work so it like deeply like integrated in the way that we had when a bunch of like, yeah, key, key leaders um, or key allies like moved on. And so I think this is the part that I've talked to other mob in other spaces about it as well. Like how, how do we yeah, build, build allies, but also also do what we need to for ourselves when actually it, it it takes a lot to like build really deadly allies who who we can trust um that's great reflections um obviously it's like one of those can of worms that will never really be answered and is very much a journey that you've been on for many years but I'm sure will continue to be on for many years too Um, So great to hear your reflections at this current point in time, kind of looking back, but also looking forward. On that note, wanted to kind of ask you the questions of which campaigns and community initiatives excite and inspire you? That can be anything that you've seen outside of SEED, inside SEED that you've worked on. What excites you about campaigning and community initiatives? Yeah, I think that we have had so many incredibly powerful like campaigns that have been led by our mob over a really long period of time like really ever since colonization effectively but when they're they're led by people who are like bringing community along with them like I think that's when they're the most powerful and you know I um over the last like few years like I feel like there has been some big shifts like in in this country I think you know when you look at like one of the things I think is really beautiful is that seed actually started like we sort of launched formally in 2014 which was actually the same year that the warriors of aboriginal resistance launched and there's this moment that like some of us um, often love to reflect back on where we all like like a bunch of the seed leaders and a bunch of the um, war leaders were together at the G20 protesting the, the G20 and um and there were you know like mining companies who were coming in and trying to influence like governments and policy and all of that and like we did a whole heap of actions together and it was just this time where it was like we were really raggedy like you know I think that um if AICC knew a bunch of what we were doing they'd be like no shut it down like it's too risky and you know like dangerous or whatever but it was like the time where we were just like working out like who we are and what we do and how we do it and and inspired by so much like grassroots activism that you know the young people who were involved like our families had had been involved in that and all these people that we looked up to you know were like leading um huge like um, campaigns and activism and the the power of of young people and that creativity and and energy in that movement is is amazing and when I look at like where we've gone since then like I think we've for for seed like the huge shift that we saw in centering our people in the climate um you know debate and conversations where we shifted the way we talked about climate change to be through the frame of talking about protecting country and because when you like what we've um what I think is so important to name is that when you talk about climate change or at least you know a few few years ago like when you're talking about climate change people automatically think of like scientists as the experts and people who aren't First Nations people as the experts but when you talk about country and protecting country automatically we are the experts like we are the experts of our own country and it centers first nations people puts first nations people in the driver's seat and like that 
I think that shift was so important for us to be able to talk with our own communities in a way that our communities understood these issues and brought our communities along with us and then educated and, and, and mobilised um, and organised like non-Indigenous people to be able to understand that as well. And I think that we've seen such a huge shift over the years where there are so many community-led initiatives now across the nation that where, where Black people you know, black fellas are leading either campaigns to like stop destructive projects on their country or to build solutions or to like advocate for funding for a range of programs or like whatever it might be. And like that shift that we've seen where there's like more and more voices of um, First Nations people on climate in so many ways is amazing and I'm like super proud of. And like even even with the bushfires, for example, like at the end of 2019, start of 2020, the conversation around the need for not just Indigenous land management, but actually land rights and like Indigenous decision-making over like what happens on our country, that response that we saw like just stood out to us so much in a way where like we wouldn't have, if those fires happened 10 years ago, like it it, it just, I, I really think that there's so much work that we did that contributed towards like a lot more leadership of our people. And there's a long way to go, but I think that's massive. And then in a similar breath, like going back to worries of Aboriginal resistance, the huge work that, you know, young people and communities did over the years, particularly when you look at the conversations around January 26, Invasion Day, and the call for abolishing Australia and abolishing the date and not just like, you know, like basically being like, it's not just about changing the date to another day where you can celebrate colonialism and white supremacy, but actually like this is a call to like really actually acknowledge the true history of this country and you know and and the need for our people to to speak our truth and be heard and like and have our you know our rights um not just acknowledged because you know the, the the Australia has agreed or like signed on to the UN rights of Indigenous people but it's not ratified like it's not legally they're not legally um accountable to actually like following it which means that they break it all the time yeah there's just like so much that those um, that yeah, young mob throughout war, like time and time again, have like put themselves really out there. And even like I know tomorrow, like Mariki Onus is um, and Crystal McKinnon and a bunch of others are in court again over putting on the Black Lives Matter rallies um, that they led in 2020 during the pandemic when George Floyd died in the US and when mob over here were outraged, not just like in solidarity with African American people in the US, but actually you know, like in the same way that George Floyd died saying, I can't breathe. So did David Dunkai Jr. in, um, in Sydney, you know, um, died in the, like at the hands of police and, and, and centering, you know, the, the fact that this is happening here too. Um, and, and it's different because, um, you know, uh, anyways, it's a whole other yarn in terms of like black people, um, you know, in the U S uh, and and black lives um, in the US as, as African American people, but the same similarly Native American people, like Indigenous people in the US, are also um, being killed. Um, you know, and anyways, I feel like that's a whole other yarn. Um, but what happened in terms of um, yeah, like the huge movement that I think has been galvanized here in this nation, particularly since 2020, with like. Yeah, um, the Black Lives Matter movement with the fires, with like all these massive moments amongst like the pandemic and the way that our community stood up and and even our response to COVID, like the leadership of Aboriginal communities to protect our communities from, you know, this, this scary virus, like I think has been so inspiring. And it just, yeah, it, sh- it just, there's so many examples of when our people are leading, like we get the best outcomes, not just for us, but for everyone. I feel like the things that I took out from that particularly was like the need for leadership as being led by the people who are most effective actually benefits both them and everyone else and really drags all of our society up um, to a place that we can be at a better spot. There's lots of pieces in there about solidarity and working together and building a sense of community, um, not on organisational lines, but on shared community values and fights um, and movement lines instead.
You're listening to Commons Conversations on Community Radio 3CR. We just heard the song Sleeping Tiger on the Bund by Wendy Meng Wang and Tim Scheel. We'll now rejoin this week's interview between Grace Vegasana, the Climate and Racial Justice Director for the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, and Millie Telford, co-founder of Seed Indigenous Youth Climate Network. Yeah, I wanted to also ask you, so of the many projects and campaigns that you've been involved in over the past 10 years, uh, what are you most proud of? I think that the work that we did at SEED, and it continues like to this day in working with um, communities, particularly across the Northern Territory in the fight against gas fracking and the fight to protect country and border and, and our future and our culture is is really incredible and you know it even before seed started working with communities in the nt like they were already um you know standing up and 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 fighting the gas fracking industry back in 2015 when we first connected with young people in Borolula, who then you know we started to then connect with communities across the whole of the northern territory the reality is is that at the time the climate movement was so focused on coal in particular um and 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 stopping you know new coal mines but also expansion of coal mines and there just like wasn't much focus on gas at all and I think you know a huge shout out to Larissa um Baldwin who I think has just like absolutely led the the work um across the nation in terms of seeing like how problematic like the gas industry is and from both the perspective of um, obviously the impact that it, it has on, on water and country and climate, but also, you know, more recently in terms of the, the COVID coordination committee being stacked with gas executives and the, um, you know, the gas industry being absolutely like in bed with government and, and the corruption um, that we've seen there. And then the need for like communities who were already worried about this and standing up and fighting it to actually be centered in the fights that, um, um, you know, are being led. Because I think arguably the climate movement's work on, on stopping coal, like hasn't always centered like coal communities. Right. Um, and, and I think you could argue that like, yeah, there's like in some places, like the work to, to try and stop gas hasn't always centered communities either, but it was, it, it has and, and will continue to be such a big important part of the campaign to stop fracking the NT um, is, is working with and bringing communities along on the journey with us. And so I think that, you know, the, there's some incredible community leaders like right across the NT who I really miss, like I don't get to work with them as much as I used to. 
are not just fighting like gas fracking, like they're fighting for their rights, they're fighting for housing, they're fighting for better roads, they're fighting for education, for funding for their communities. And, you know, often like the gas industry gets sold as like the, the you know, that will be the key to unlock that future, which is absolute bullshit. And so I think just being able to, yeah, relentlessly stand up and fight and know that like we were like so far, like the fact that the Northern Territory isn't a shale gas field, um, like, is the win like it is a huge win like for communities because they've held off these companies and held off government for so long and there's quotes from some of the gas companies saying like the it's not it's not because of money or the, like the economics or whatever it's actually the lack of social license that we can't actually do what we need to on the ground um and so i think that is just yeah h- hugely inspiring um it's a it's a lot of work and and um, and it's not easy work, but um, if, yeah, if there's anything that I'm proud of and it's definitely not just me, it's like a massive collective effort, but it's, yeah, it's the campaign to stop to stop fracking in the NT. What are the impacts or ripples you've seen come from this work externally? I guess this was one of the first big campaigns that SEED really led ourselves. Like prior to that, we were working in solidarity on the campaign to stop Adani we always were coming from the perspective of like, how do we support the Wangana Jagalingu Family Council? How do we support other traditional owner groups like along them, um, like from the mine site, the railway, like right out to the port. But for us taking on the campaign in the NT, you know, Lock the Gate had done a whole lot of groundwork, but like there, yeah, there, there just wasn't the work happening, I guess, at a national scale. And also in a way that was telling the stories from the voices of people on the ground. And I really think that, yeah, like when you look at centering our people in our communities in the story about the, you know, what the problem is, like in terms of the um, like fossil fuel industry, not only like forcing these, these um, you know, destructive, dangerous, like risky projects onto, onto communities, but, you know, telling that bigger narrative as well around like the fact that this is not just happening in the NT, like this is a tactic that mining companies like with governments have used over and over again across this nation right around the world to get access to to land and to displace like um, First Nations communities in order to just like line their own pockets and and absolutely exploit communities. Like there's a bigger story there that I think we in in building the narrative and like the campaign around yeah, communities fighting fracking the NT, we, because we, we centered those voices and those stories, like, I think it really helped, yeah, like the, the rest of the country understand that this is like where, whatever the projects are, but, you know, starting with gas fracking the NT, like it is Aboriginal land and it is Aboriginal communities. And um, when communities have access to all of the information about, you know, what these projects would mean for them, you know, more often than not, communities want to stand up and and fight back and actually call for for alternatives that don't force them to exploit their land and, and, and each other. And so I think, yeah, like externally, like I think that story being centered in all of the work not only helped like build large scale, like awareness around the country about this issue, but also then, you know, contributed to to like big wins that we were able to see. Like even last year, the as we were trying to um, call for, um, you know, no public funding to to go to funding fracking in the Northern Territory, like we were able to, um, we had a whole bunch of traditional owners. We did this in partnership with the Get Up First Nations Justice team, travelled to Canberra and like met with senators and, and members of parliament and we were able to uh you know get a, a senate inquiry into public funding for fracking the NT whilst the outcome was that you know like Labor did end up still supporting the government's uh the Morrison government's like proposal for you know however many billion dollars or whatever it was for fracking like we did have this opportunity to really shine a light on the corruption and the huge huge risks and concerns that communities have about this issue and so I think yeah like just constantly centering those community voices like has yeah gone gone a really long way in people understanding why that's important and then also um has contributed to 
yeah, the lack of social license, like that is holding companies back um, and also, you know, um, holding the government accountable and calling out their corruption as well. As an aside, I think the work being done in the NT and WA has like deeply transformed the way we also think about those states and those communities. I think for a really long time, the climate movement has really treated those areas that are so densely populated with Aboriginal communities who definitely don't have the same like quality of life as potentially like a lot of East Coast communities and the resourcing that comes from the, the East Coast economy and is very much like sacrifice those communities knowing that they couldn't work on everything. But I think the work being done in the NT and the WA is like deeply transforming the narrative and has left such a huge legacy for how we think about gas fracking, but also extraction and colonisation and what that looks like in a very tangible way. So huge, huge impact. Um, Very exciting to see both like winds coming out of Origin Energy, even though their dogs had actually sold that to someone else anyways. But I think there's like really tangible wins that we we're also able to see coming out of that, that I think is translatable to like the everyday person beyond just the community work that you're doing to transform those communities and their leadership capa- capacity that they're handing down through generations too. For yourself, when you look back on the last 10 years, uh, do you see any key milestones that really shape you as a person that you learnt from or grew from? Yeah, absolutely. In the early days, like when we were really trying to just like fight to have a voice, like as Aboriginal people, like in 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 the climate movement, um, something that really gave me hope and like inspiration and and sort of support was building connections with um First Nations people internationally. And so like the Pacific Climate Warriors, um, the Indigenous Environmental Network, Indigenous Climate Action Canada, seeing, yeah, the way that they were doing this work in their own communities, like in their countries across the world, um, was huge. And I know that when we then got to a point where we were able to like bring out a whole bunch of people like um Candy Mossett, or she goes by Candy White now, um, Ariel de Ranger, um, you know, the the huge legacy that Kareti um, Tiamalu left, the, yeah, the huge work that like all the Pacific Climate Warriors have done um, and just like having each other, like to be able to, um, to, to call on and support. But when we brought those people out um, to Australia to like some of the big events that we did with our mob, like I actually think like that when like, yeah, hearing their stories and like their stories of the impact that like climate change and the fossil fuel industry was having on their communities, but also the way they were leading and the way they were, you know, fighting back um, is what inspired like so many young people um, in seed and, and like across communities, even particularly like Candy talking about like oil fracking in, you know, like in her homelands um, in, in North Dakota, being able to bring her um, and Ariel talking about the tar sands, like in Canada, bringing them to the NT and meeting with communities in the NT was like huge. Yeah, like all of this had a big impact on me because like it, it it gave me the strength and support that I needed to sort of like um, continue on and like know that what we were doing, like there was a much bigger picture sort of like vision and, and journey that we were working towards. But then also like um, just building so many relationships with so many mob across the country. Like I feel so grateful to have had the opportunity to connect with so many different people doing incredible work um, across the nation and doing so in a way that you know I like I was learning from everyone just as much as like they were learning from me and I think you know there's there's different moments that I think you know sort of like hurt along the way as well like where um, you know, I talked before about being a bit naive and, you know, sort of optimistic. And and there are a few moments where like there were some key people who were like, oi, Millie, you know, and like sort of like pulled me back to um, like to uh, like grounded me like in, you know, and held me accountable. And that actually is hugely important, like for for anyone, but like, yeah, for for young people, like leading in these spaces, like to have those people around you who who have your back, but also can hold you when you need to be like given feedback as well and yeah and then even just like more recently like knowing that there is a huge legacy that we've left but actually 
it got to a point, you know, sort of like early this year that I realized I was putting so much of myself into this work that I wasn't really like leaving much in the cup for myself. And, and, and that wasn't going too well, you know, like I had to prioritize myself in order to like keep going, like in this broader fight for justice for our people and having that moment of realizing like, you know, um, yeah, it was time to to move on, to hand over the reins, like to allow others to step up and, and take that on and to, yeah, give myself permission to be able to like have a break and like walk away in order to put my my time and energy into other things. And so, yeah, it's been a journey. I've learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And I also love that you ended on the note that a key moment was actually choosing yourself in this fight as well and like the longevity and the care that you need and I think the rest that you've taken across this year is also resistance in itself whether that's like resistance against the capitalist grind or resistance against being really coupled again like with something that is um, both incredible but also is also really hard work and is really emotionally draining and can't be carried by just like one person in that form of leadership. So I think it's also really inspiring to take big periods of rest and acknowledge that. So you've talked a lot about looking back, you've had a lot of moments that define your leadership that also comes into the way that you've had to strategize and work with communities in a really like collaborative way of bringing both people in who are on the front lines of fights but also people who internationally are living those fights but have so much to offer to communities and to yourself um so what what has been these moments that really define this period for you um and your sense of leadership I think you know in the really big picture like when you look at the vision of the world that we're trying to create I've been doing a bunch of sort of like visioning recently um in the context of thinking about like there's an upcoming referendum like in this country um where First Nations voices and issues are going to be like at the center of that debate and like and really thinking about the opportunity we have to create some transformational change and like transformational policy change um but actually paint a vision of like what like paint a picture of what that vision is for the world that we're actually working towards and like what are the steps along the way in terms of how to get there and whilst you could like zoom into like a specific campaign and look at what it's going to take to like win that exact campaign like there's a broader you know strategy that you have to look at is like how do we um like how is everything that we're doing working towards the vision of like what we're actually trying to create together um like and and what does that look like and and I actually don't think we spend enough time on imagining what that world looks like because it's so hard to imagine anything different to what we've experienced now and so so much energy goes into like fighting the bad stuff and like you know not enough energy going into like building the good stuff which actually you know is what it's going to take to get people to understand and visualize and actually believe that that is possible like the 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 vision that we're working towards is possible and so I think that the values and principles that we have around how we lead, like in these moments is so important, like that we do so where where we're open to being accountable to the communities that we serve, where we, you know, feel that deep sense of responsibility, bringing like everyone along with us and having the conversations, conversations that need to be had, doing so like with integrity and, you know, I'm really prioritizing like building those relationships and connections, like I think is absolutely critical. And And you can have like the most like strategic campaign plan or whatever, where sure, like you might win, I don't know, um, net zero by 2030 or like whatever. Um, But if you like haven't brought the community along with you, then like, you know, to be honest, I'm sort of like, well, in some ways, like what's the point? Like where was your mandate to actually do that? And I think having a mandate is actually one of the most powerful things you can do because then you're actually building power in a way that's going to like shift power to ideally not end up in another mess like down the track like because you haven't like done that work and so um yeah I think um I think just like yeah really like taking that time to invest in people and like do the organizing work do the training and the and the the leadership building and um you know for for seed like in the early days when we were working out 
who we are and what we do and how we do it. And there's like the campaigning side, th side of things, the movement building side of things and the storytelling side of things. Like so much of all of that was how do we build not just the leadership of young people to be leaders in their communities? Because there's all these like Indigenous youth leadership programs out there that do all this leadership stuff and then like basically throw people out into the world and say, good luck. Like that's not what we were about. It's like, how do we build up people in a way that, gives them what they need to like be leading action in their communities. And that leadership comes in all sorts of like shapes and forms, but doing so in a way that we're building transferable skills, like, and building their confidence and knowledge where like, even now you look at where seed volunteers and, and staff who got involved over the years, like they're working in all these different spaces, like whether it's in activism and advocacy or in like creative, like arts and music and like, um, like Vanessa in the Northern Territory, like leading a language um, revival program um, is amazing. Yeah. Like how do you, how do you like build the capacity of us for that bigger vision? I think is so important. You've been listening to Commons Conversations produced by the Commons Social Change Library for Community Radio 3CR. Today we brought you an interview between Grace Vegasana, the Climate and Racial Justice Director for the Australian Youth Climate Coalition and Millie Telford co-founder of Seed Indigenous Youth Climate Network, whose work continues to focus on First Nations justice via a new role at Australian Progress.